Hello everybody, welcome to Online Trading Academy and OT Academy's webinar series. Today we've got a very special topic for you and there are a lot of major headwinds that are facing our market. So I want to start off with an overall kind of uh, statement about today's webinar. Now the title of it says how to hedge against five big financial threats in 2019. But let's be honest, some of these threats might not come into play until 2020, 2023, 2025. Bottom line is, we're gonna identify some major things that personally I feel will go on for eternity. They will be things that will be relevant in financial markets until the end of time. However, there's always this ebb and flow of information and of market cycles and of boom and bust cycles. So it's really about understanding when these events happen, what we should be doing, and how we should be positioning ourselves. Some of these five that we're gonna talk about today, you might feel that we are in the midst of and knee deep right now but they might not pan out to be a big opportunity for a few years. So with that said, let's get started with our top five items here, which we think will be the major market headwinds and how we can potentially hedge against those. Our first one we can see here is the return of inflation. It sounds like a Batman series, but the return of inflation is something that actually should be considered as a real threat because we have had a prolonged period of, I'll say manipulation, where if you look at this price chart of inflation going back to the 1920s, we've had some pretty massive swings. For example, if you look back in the 1920s, we had a peak of inflation in 1920 of 23.7%. Just one year later, we also had our lowest ever inflation rate, we'll call it deflation, at negative 15.8. Now, if you put those two numbers together, you're looking at a 30, well, we'll call it a 39% swing in inflation rate. That is a monstrous move, which of course has massive impacts on the economy that led to the roaring 20s. And we could go into a whole nother story about the roaring 20s. Bottom line was it was very volatile back then. Now we have had periods where we've seen kind of controlled inflation right in the year 1960s. You see things were relatively flat, followed by the 80s under Paul Volcker, where we had interest rates getting up into the 16% mark. Can you imagine having a 30 year mortgage paying 16% interest? Most of us right now are cheering and high-fiving because we're getting sub-3% mortgage rates. 16% might change the dynamics of the market significantly. Now, on the hard right edge here, really since, call it the late 90s, we've been on a slow drift down. And historically, our average for inflation is 3.27%. Now, what's interesting about this one is if you go back just until probably about six months ago, we were running about 2.9%. As of today, we're running 1.6. So we're actually below our historical averages. Not to say that uh, that is all roses and happiness, but we are very, very low historically right now. So I want you to look at this a little bit deeper and closer. Just because we have rising interest rates, most people think that when rates rise significantly, we have a, a huge drawdown in the markets and markets get crushed. That's not necessarily true. Here's that same chart of inflation or of interest rates going back from 1960 to today. And I wanted to put the S&P 500 over this to give you an understanding of what it has done for the markets. Now you can see that over time, the S&P, which is the candlestick chart in the background, has done pretty well. There have been some major market pullbacks, but it doesn't necessarily correlate with interest rates. Maybe if we zoom in closer to the 80s, here we have 1960 to 1990. Now this is where you'll really get a clear understanding that it's not just the inflation number that destroys markets. S&P, you can put on here as well, you can see that there were some periods of time where those big spikes in inflation did have a problem with the market, like 1984, five, and six. But look from 19, I'll have uh, our tech guy put the cursor on the screen here. If you go from like mid 70s, rates were real high and markets actually were starting to rally up. So it doesn't, it's not a direct correlation. I don't want you to think that just because we have high inflation means the markets are gonna get crushed. That's actually almost the contrary. As we have rising inflation, it's actually good for economies, and I'll explain that here in a second. Now, let's zoom in even closer, because most of us don't remember the 60s or the 40s or the 20s, but we might remember 1997 through till today. And many of you are living in this world right now as your 401k and retirement accounts are reaping the rewards of a 340% move since 2009. But what has the central bank done? What has our Fed done to help this market and slow it down? We're gonna put interest rates on here. And this is the uh, Fed funds rate going back to 1997. And you can see that when the market started to sell off, they aggressively lowered rates. You can see from 2001 to 2003, we went from about six and a half percent all the way down to one in a period of two years. But as the market started to rally and have this big move from 2003 to 2008, which as you can see right from here to here, they also raised 17 times to slow it down. 
The point we're talking about today, which says here is why we think that there's a big problem and a disconnect in this, is if you notice from 2009, all of a sudden it went flatline. Now when most people go flatline, they die. Well, the markets did not die. This flatline is actually a catalyst. You can think of it as uh, a big fuel pump for our markets. And it went on for a very long period of time, the longest we've ever seen. The Fed did not do anything to slow down this market rally until 2016. Well, 15 is really when they started raising, but you can see that the number's increasing here now. Now, we are still well below historical averages, right at two and a quarter percent. There's talk that this year the Fed will not raise and maybe even lower should the economy start to have some issues. So just wanted to show you that right now the Fed is using this effectively as a tool to control or slow market growth or actually help speed it up. And it's been working from the late 90s. Uh, I debate that it's working right now. I think it might be getting out of hand, but that's for the markets to determine. So the question is, how do we hedge against this? What do we do? The first one might shock you a little bit here, and that is go to the stock market, buy into stocks. And you're going to hold on a second. We're at all time highs, we're at record highs, and you're saying that if inflation becomes an issue to buy stocks, yes, because what is inflation a sign of? Inflation is a sign of prices increasing, which means that companies will have bigger revenues. Now, that doesn't mean to just buy and hold forever. It's really all about market timing. The big issue with buying into a market that's in an amazing uptrend is that that trend will come to an end. So if we start to see inflation rise, the market will probably continue for a bit until it turns. There is a point where inflation will get too high and it will stifle economic growth. So you have to pay attention to that one. The other one is commodities. Obviously, commodities like gold, silver, generally precious metals are one of the better hedges against inflationary environments. Now, this one is going to be a surprise to most, and that is going to be tips. Now, these are products that are adjusted for inflation. They're kind of tied to inflation. They're called Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Now, those will rise in value as inflation or interest rates rise. So this is something that if you feel like we're in a rising rate environment and we may see that continue, tips are a great way to go. Bonds may not be, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. We also have the housing markets. If you look back historically, um, tips and housing have been two of the best hedges against an inflationary environment. So uh, now that those rates are low, maybe it's time to go out there and get yourself a home and um, give a little bit of security to a rising rate environment and inflation. All right, that's number one. Number two on this is record high debt. Oh, one of my personal favorites. When we talk about record high debt, it's important to look at where we stand as a global community, not just the United States, because I know we have a lot of viewers from around the world and welcome everybody from around the world. Hope you're all having a great day out there today. Uh, let's start with the number of household debt. And you can see since 2013 through 2018, there's been a pretty significant increase. You know, it looks to me just ballparking here, about a 100% increase, which isn't really that bad. But it's not the households we're worried about. Hopefully, as households, we are controlling our debt. The next one's non-financial corporate. So this is really telling us how much debt corporations are taking on. And I think that you guys can see that in Q1 of 2018, there was a significant bump in the amount. It's not the same percentage growth as we see in households. Non-financial corporate, really taking on a lot of debt here. Now, of course, you could make the argument that it's good. Taking on debt is good as long as we can get a rate of return on that debt that's greater than what we are paying for. That's called good debt. Bad debt is when we take on debt and we're not getting a rate of return that equals that amount of return. So that is a, a pretty important piece for us. Now, let's go one step further and look at the big culprit, the villain, right? There's always a villain in here. And it looks to me, as who is taking on the biggest burden so far? Who's taking on more debt? That's our government. And you know, we obviously are gonna hear a lot about this going into 2020 with our presidential campaigns. It's about debt, it's about economy, but you know, it's not a Democrat or Republican thing. This is our government failing to manage money properly and taking on more and more debt. Now, let's go to the last one here, which is financials. The interesting, thing about, interesting part about financials is really in 2008, you see the biggest jump. They took a huge leap forward in financial debt in 2008. It actually looks like they're scaling back right now, which is probably a wise thing to do as we might be hitting a rising rate environment. 
Now, uh, as we look at this, I want to go into obviously what is the, the major hedge for this stuff. I want to uh, real quickly come back and, and go over the poll. I forgot to do that, so thank you guys so much for the poll. Uh, we did a Twitter poll that said, you know, what's, what do you think is the safest way to hedge against inflation? And 55% of the viewers out there said gold. Okay, and I think that that's because that's what we've been taught. Historically, that's what the universities say. It's almost every finance textbook says gold's the way to go. Not that that's right or wrong, but that's what most people said, 55%. 37% said liquidate to cash. And that's actually going to be one that we talk about here a bit in this presentation today, but it's about what cash, right? If, if you are going into a currency that has a, uh, a government backing it that's got massive debt, <coughs> U.S. dollar, <coughs> U.S. dollar, uh, it could be problematic for that currency, which means it might not be the safest place to go. The other one said buy index funds. Okay, 7% said buy index funds. And what we mean by index funds, for those of you who might not know, an index fund is a basket of securities which will reflect usually a market, like the S&P 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, NASDAQ 100. Uh, most people go with like the SPY, which is the S&P 500. And 1% said buy crypto. I thought it was interesting that we only saw 1% out there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about cryptos near the end of this, but only 1%. So we, we don't see a lot of support out there in the crypto space as a hedge against uh, inflation and environment. Okay, so let's go to our record high debt here. And I want to go to a simple example, which I believe all of us can relate to. If you think of government, it's just an, it's a living, breathing entity, right? It's a business. And your personal day-to-day -day life is a business. You have income, you have expenses, you have liabilities. It's a simple formula. You've heard webinars that we've done before on that topic. So let's take Keith here. Keith is uh, an individual, just got a job. He's making $4,000 a year. So you're like, yeah, I've got $4,000, uh, sorry, a year. What country is he working? $4,000 a month. And if you look at it, $4,000 might seem like a good, money depending, a good money depending on where you live in the world, but that's not what he's getting. He's actually going to be getting himself $3,200 after taxes because Keith lives in sunny California. So let's just make two columns here. We've got income and we've got debt. Right now, it doesn't look like he has any debt, but we need to break down his financials, as all of you should be doing. And there's some calculators at otacademy.com under tools that you can use to calculate out this and figure out exactly where you stand. Let's start with the basics. He's got a roof over his head. Nice one bedroom apartment here in Southern California, $1,500. You notice right away, income drops significantly. All right, he's got utilities. He's got to pay that water bill, electrical. He's got internet. That's $415 a month. Now the balance is starting to shift a little bit. You can see debt getting a little bit higher. He's got himself a car because of course in California, you don't take the buses anywhere. You've got to get yourself a nice car to be cool. $369 a month for that BMW 3 Series that he's got because it's a keep up with the Jones's world here in SoCal. And of course, he went to college because you've got to have a college degree to succeed in life. Right, Bill Gates? $517.86 a month to finance his $45,000 of student loans. So we're starting to see things shift. Now all of a sudden, he's got his regular stuff. $800. This is for gas for his car, some new shoes, going out and eating lunch every day with his colleagues from work, dinner at home, some new clothes. You know, his ice mocha frappuccino every day that costs $6. That adds up. $800 for his monthly expenses. And that's not entirely it. He still has $200 a month that he's paying on credit cards. You'll notice that this equation has shifted. Keith no longer has this wonderful smiley face because he's living in Southern California with a dream job. He's broke. He's in debt and he's crying. Why? Because if you run your business like this, if you run your life like this at a deficit of $600 a month, you are on a fast track to bankruptcy. What can you do? Well, you might be able to get a, put yourself in more debt to pay this off, but that's just a, a fool's errand. We have to control our expenses. We have to adjust our consumption patterns so that our income never goes below zero. And we always have money in the bank to protect ourselves for a rainy day event. Now, if you look at our government debt in millions, so you can see back in the 1930s, we'll bring on a little uh, illustration here in blue, 1930s, we didn't really have much debt as a country. It really started to spike in the 80s. Now, right around 2000, we broke the $5 trillion worth of U.S. debt. But I want you guys to look at this slope. We did a webinar a month ago talking about bubbles, boom-bust cycles. And I think that everybody watching this right now would look at this chart. If you watched that webinar we did last month, you can find it at the archives at otacademy.com. You would look at this and go, that is a bubble. That is moving up way too quick. And you can see the acceleration really happened from 2009. That's this little, this divot right in here. 
we saw things really just go parabolic from that point. So this becomes very, very dangerous for us. And to really drive home the point of why this is so dangerous, I wanted to bring on one other asset class here, which some of you love, some of you hate it. According to the uh, poll, 1% of you think it's good as a hedge. And that is the chart of Bitcoin. Everybody's like, Bitcoin, it's a bubble. It's never going to go anywhere. Here's a chart of Bitcoin. I just overlaid it over our U.S. debt. And you'll notice that curve, that arc, that acceleration that people just marvel at with Bitcoin. It's very similar to what we see with the U.S. debt. And of course, you can see what happened with Bitcoin's price. This is actually recent as of today, so it's been a pretty sharp slide down. If the U.S. debt were to do something like this, I think that all of us agree that there would be some major changes going on because the only way we could get from 200 or for, sorry, to $22 trillion worth of debt down to $5 trillion would be $17 trillion worth of cutbacks. So uh, the unemployment line might be long. Uh, there might be some real big cutbacks in our infrastructure as well. And the other part here I want you guys to understand is that when we look at this number, we see $22 trillion. That's the total on the book liabilities. What you're not seeing out here is the unfunded liabilities. This is Social Security and Medicare that you and I pay into with every single paycheck. It's going into this fund. It is a black hole of finance. There is $220 trillion of unfunded liabilities. Imagine if you personally in your life had this, your, your income was $10,000 a month, your expenses were $15,000 a month. So you're already running negative $5,000 a month, but you owed $100,000 a month in interest on some project. That's essentially what is going on here with our government debt and unfunded liabilities. It is scary. Now, we'll probably hear more in our political campaigns about how they're going to do reform on Social Security, reform on Medicare, Medicaid, that type of stuff. But right now, that's the facts. $220 trillion of unfunded liabilities plus the $22 trillion we have on our books. That's a lot of money that people are on the hook for, our government in particular. All right, let's continue on here uh, and go to the hedging aspects of it. So how do we hedge against that risk, against high global debt? Probably the, the most logical thing would be to get out of those markets respectively, meaning let's go into something that's physical and tangible. Hard assets seem to be a recurring theme against hedging against inflation, global debt. We're talking gold, buying into commodities like gold and silver, platinum, palladium could also be used, maybe rare coins. Those are uh, always good investments there because you can hold those physically. They're not in a central bank, not in a bank at all, depending on where you store them. Now, we also have currency on here. And remember, a lot of you said liquidate to cash. 37% said liquidate to cash as a hedge for global debt. Well, that's true to a point. It's important that you understand which currency to go to. Right? You could have the euro, you could have the yen, you could have the US dollar, you could even have the drachma or the peso. When one currency is tanking, another currency is rallying. So this is really important that as you're looking to hedge, that you don't just say, well, I'm going to dollars. I'm going all cash. That's dangerous. What we teach in our classes is saying, look, let's identify which one to put our money into. Because if the US dollar starts to crash and you put your money in dollars, you're losing money. But if the U.S. dollar crashes, something like the Japanese yen might rally or the ruble. It, there could be any amount of currencies going in the opposite direction. So really important that we do the analysis and find out exactly where to put our money if we decide to go to cash, which would be a good hedge against global debt. All right, number three, bond market worries. Oh, this is a good one. There are a lot of great videos talking about the bond market and some of the issues that you can find there at otacademy.com. Uh, those are free. Uh, Bill Addis is one that's done some great work in this area. Let's talk deeper about bond market worries. So I want you to first start by looking at the 10-year note, okay, the 10-year treasury yield. Now, why is this important? Because if you own a home, it's benchmarked off of the 10-year. So what you want to see if you're a home buyer or a consumer of pretty much anything is you want to see these yields as low as possible. Why? Because low yields mean cheap money. And if money is cheap, it's cheap for us to borrow. Therefore, we can take this money and we can consume, which drives our economy even more. So you're wondering, well, why is it dropping like this? Well, the reason we're seeing it so low, and it's at historical lows right now. You see 2015 uh, is the most recent date. The hard red edge, we're starting to take off a little bit. That's 2018. The reason we're so low is because we've had three major participants making major purchases. You've had China. You've had Japan and you've had the Fed. 
basically buying everything that we can put out there with regards to treasuries, whether those are short-term or intermediate-term securities. What that does is by buying it, it pushes the prices of bonds up. They're driving bond prices up, and in turn, the yields drop. Now, why is this a problem? It's a problem because when you have three customers and they buy all of your goods, imagine you guys are business owners right now and you have a store and you sell widgets. And while you may have 10,000 customers, three of your customers buy 95% of your widgets. What happens if all three of those decide to take a hike? Well, let's look at a, a, a similar example. Let's take Boeing, for example, right? Boeing sells aircraft, one of the largest in the world. So Boeing sells aircraft and they sell to their three major clients here, Qantas, you've got United, and you have Virgin. They buy a bulk of Boeing's planes. So obviously Boeing's revenue are driven by these three entities. But what would happen if all of a sudden Qantas, Virgin, and United said, you know what, we want to hold off. Matter of fact, we're not gonna buy any more planes. So now Boeing is left with all of this inventory, their bread and butter, they should be selling these to their major clients and their major clients are saying, no, we don't wanna buy it. What do you think would happen to Boeing's share price if that happened? Well, we've made a little comical example here, but here's the price of Boeing going back from 2009 to 2019, the last decade. It's gone from $50 to $400. Why? Global growth. Qantas is buying more aircraft. Virgin's buying more aircraft. Uh, United buying more aircraft. But what if they stopped? What do you think's gonna happen to their share price? That's right, those aircraft are gonna pile up and boom, you get a crash in Boeing's stock. Why is this important? because our bond market has been propped up by three major players, Japan, China, and the Fed. And all three have gone about it in a way that wasn't sneaky, it wasn't secretive, it wasn't like, let's just scale back a little bit. They've basically made major media statements saying, we are not buying anymore, we're done. The Fed, not only are they not buying, they are selling what they own, they're unwinding their balance sheet. So. This could be a huge problem for us. If the people who have been driving bond prices up, remember bond prices go up, yields go down. If the buying stops, what do you think is gonna happen to the yields? All of a sudden, prices of those bonds are gonna decline and you're going to see the yields spike. That is the problem here because we are right now in an environment where all of us in this room, my entire studio staff and team, we've got mortgages. We've got car payments, and it's based off very low numbers. If that spikes, all of a sudden, we might not be able to meet our debt obligations. Those of you with adjustable rate mortgages, you really might want to do some thinking this weekend. All right, let's take another quick look at something like Tesla. Tesla, the darling stock out here in California. The company is making electric cars and revolutionizing the world. I got to buy that stock, right? Think again. This is another issue of debt. It goes right back to the example of Keith not able to make his payments and responsibilities in his daily life. What about corporate life? Take a peek at this balance sheet for uh, Tesla. This is the liabilities, meaning how much they owe. Now down here at the bottom, you have total liabilities in 2015 with $6.9 billion. That's neither good nor bad. I think a lot of analysts would say that's probably bad, but remember, you're starting a car company, so it's gonna be some uh, upfront expenses. But in one year, they went, they increased $10 billion. We're now at $16.7 billion. And then in 2017, we jump another $7 billion to $23 billion. Debt is going one way. It's increasing for Tesla. Now, the problem here is the revenues for Tesla have been doing great. They're selling more cars than ever, right? So here's a chart of revenue versus earnings. As their revenue, their sales is booming, they're making less money. So you're selling more, but you're making less money. That's a recipe for disaster. And if you get to the point where your revenue is so low, you can't pay your debt obligations, what does that mean? That means that you end up filing for bankruptcy. And there's talk, people worried about Tesla going to bankruptcy. That's why you could buy right now a bond for Tesla at 5.3%, because there's risk there. I can buy a treasury for 2.2%. You want that extra three? Well, you can buy Tesla, but there's risk there. You really want to be risky, go to GE, 8.3%. GE, a lot of people think you're going to file for bankruptcy. So their yield on those bonds is reflective of its risk. Tesla's starting to get riskier, and their bond rating has been slashed recently. They're just above junk. So how do we hedge against the bond market? Well, you don't buy bonds <laughs> because the bottom will fall out of those. those. The price of those bonds will drop. Now, what could you buy? Tips. This goes back to our Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. 
This is going to rise as we start to see, see yields spike if they do spike. Of course, again, this is all about when it happens. It hasn't happened quite yet. I think we're in the midst of this one. The tips would give us a greater possibility to adapt to that yield increase. So if we went from, let's say, the 10-year right now, let's call it 3%, we jump to 6, your tips would adjust with that. So you would be making money as interest rates rise. A great way to capitalize on a rising rate environment. All right. Number four, unpredictable global events. Oh, this is a big one. We've talked about this one in the past, but the, I think it's an ever-present danger, regardless of what country you live in. I was watching some videos yesterday talking about Silvio Berlusconi destroying Italy. He's not even there anymore, and they're still talking about him as a political threat. So here's what I see facing the U U.S. You have uh, Mr. Trump, you've got Brexit, you've got trade war, and, of course, central banks and our government. Now, let's walk through a couple of these. I think it goes without saying that our uh, Twitter-in-chief is a threat simply because of his tweets could crush a stock or cause it to go through the roof. That, to me, is a threat. I'm not saying about him as a person. I don't want him to go down that road. But he is just one of the more vocal and... Um, uh, his ability to tweet out and manipulate these markets is a threat to all of us that hold stocks or involve in the markets. To me, this is probably the single greatest event that's going to happen in this next decade will be the Brexit. Now, why is this so important? Well, you have to understand that all those countries in blue or shades of blue are part of the European Union. That is a massive ecosystem of economies, cultures, and languages. Right now, it's unified under a currency and specific rules. But what happens if this changes? What happens if the UK decides to pull out of the EU, which they voted to do? They haven't come up with the resolutions on how to do that. They still have issues to solve, which are, well, issue number one is going to be trade. All the goods and services that right now flow freely from the United Kingdom into, let's say, Hamburg, Germany or uh, Paris, France, those all now have new rules they have to follow. Immigration is another important issue. People want to move from, let's say, Munich to Cardiff. Well, now they have to go through a whole different process to get in. And as you've, anybody who's tried to move to America understands, immigration issues can be rather tough sometimes. Now, you also have travel. Even traveling to the UK will be different. We'll have to go through different lines. Now, there'll be a different customs process. It used to be so easy, especially within the European Union. You have borders. There's talks about this border up here in Ireland where they're talking about having armed guards and a wall and towers. It's like... We're going back to the Stone Ages. They, they never had that before, and all of a sudden we're putting in uh, measures that we haven't seen implemented. So this is a threat systemically. You also have tariffs. What's the taxation going to be like from Paris when they send Fragua up to Edinburgh? Right? There will be differences in tariff taxation. So this is all one gigantic unknown of how this entire ecosystem of countries functions together. That will bring in global instability. And that, to me, is a major problem. There's also major events that we see going on right now, things like gun control, which, of course, is more of an issue here in the United States. Um, you have abortion, which is now becoming a major political talking point here in the United States. But, again, these issues can be around the world. You have welfare drug testing. You have health care systems, terrorism, uh, drug pricing regulation, which, uh, you know, it's nuts when you look at the price of pharmaceutical drugs here in the United States compared to the rest of the world. It's really kind of embarrassing. Um, you have net neutrality, you're talking about internet control, uh, and then even things as simple as legalization of marijuana. Right now, that's a major thing in the United States. I know you Dutch are going, come on, we've already been there for 30 years, what are you guys doing? But these are all going to be pieces that are going to impact our markets going forward. Uh, there are I mean that in not only a, a negative sense, but some of these could prevent, present some great investment opportunities. So how do we hedge against that, these unpredictable events? Again, for me, hedging against a global uncertainty is going to things that you can hold and keeping it out of a government control. That, again, goes back to things like hard assets. So for the 55% of you that said gold, yeah, that's probably one of the better places to be in here with regards to global political events. Uh, also, again, cash. So I think the last two events really dealing with cash being a not necessarily a hedge, but more of a protection against it. Of course, that's kind of a synonym. Uh, hedging and protection kind of go hand in hand. But finding the right currency to be in is the, the important piece here. Even if you decide to go to hard assets and precious metals, you know, we can line up gold, platinum, silver, palladium and say, well, which one of those is going to give me the best investment opportunity going forward? Because there will be one that will be the clear winner out of that, and it's not necessarily gold. All right, our final one leads us to uh, of the phenomenon of central banks. Started off as an experiment. Now it seems to be a pretty uh, implemented piece around the world, but it's overzealous central banks. Now, why do we say overzealous central banks? Well, it's the central banks that have really been manipulating our markets in the United States and markets around the world because they control monetary policy. They can change the amount of dollars that are out there. They can change lending rates, etc. 
So I want to just show you real quick what the U.S. Federal Reserve, I apologize for those of you who might be in India or Europe, I don't have your central bank numbers here, but we're going to focus on the U.S. because um, it's scary what has happened. And again, it goes back to a change in the way that we have been doing things. And all of a sudden, we're doing it differently. We're doing it in unexplored territory, and that could have consequences down the line. So I'll just fast forward it here real quick on this chart. I clicked on gold. Can you guys see that massive spike in gold that the Fed has uh, participated in over the last 15 years? Yeah, neither can I. Because it's a little blue line at the bottom. It hasn't changed at all. They're really doing nothing with regards to increasing their gold reserves. So that was kind of my punchline joke of the day. Thanks, folks. I'm a stand-up comedian as well. Here you have the U.S. Treasury markets. Now, this is where we talk about quantitative easing. Part one, part two, part three, Operation Twist. This is where that $3.5 trillion worth of debt comes in, of fabricated capital. Now, we are unwinding. You can see on that hard red edge, there's a slow drift down, and we have been on a pretty steady unwind of this Fed balance sheet with regards to U.S. Treasuries. But it's the amount that we increased from, uh, you can see on the chart here, went from $500, uh, 500 billion to 2.5 trillion. That's a $2 trillion increase of buying their own goods and services. That's, that's nice. Prop up your own market. Amazing. This is the one that scares me. It's mortgage-backed securities. Now, many of you might not live in the United States, but back in 2008, we had a major meltdown. We had subprime lending, and a lot of these people, let's be honest, had no business owning a home. You don't have a job, you have no income, sure, we'll give you a loan for $500,000. That's what was going on here in the U.S., and it was embarrassing. Well, in order to prevent this market from going into an absolute free fall, what they did is they aggregated mortgages together in a basket of securities. They called those mortgage-backed securities, and then they would sell that as one big group of investments. Now, who bought all the junk? Because if you had a basket of securities of subprime mortgages but with people who were about to default and couldn't make their payments, why would you buy that? That's like buying a penny stock that's gone from $1,000 to a penny, and you're like, it's going to come back. No, it's garbage. It's going to bankruptcy. So the Fed bought all of this junk that nobody wanted. And now, fast forward nine years, 10 years, the Fed's saying, okay, all right, we're at the point where we need to unload it. But look how much they want to unload. That red shaded area is a massive amount. You're looking at $2 trillion, well, $1.5, almost $2 trillion worth of subprime mortgage-backed securities. That is not a good investment to be unloading. And put yourself in the position of a consumer. If you wanted to buy some mortgage-backed securities, I want ones that are stable, going to give me a good rate of return. In this case, these mortgage-backed securities, for the most part, those are the bad ones. That's the junk that nobody wanted. Now, we can make the argument that our economy is much more stable right now. Those people who are struggling may have found jobs. They might be able to make their payments now, so it might have improved, but it's still the stuff that nobody wanted to begin with. So when they unload this, who's going to buy it? So I think that this will probably be one of the major impacts in our markets as they unwind this mortgage-backed security info or, or inventory they have. How is that going to impact the markets? I don't personally know, and I'm going to be watching the housing market data to see how that impacts it. We'll be watching some of the lending rates to see if it's going to impact there. But that is a big unknown that I don't hear too many people talking about. Uh, we also have other securities, so they were buying into other market securities. We could talk about equity markets, but it's really not a major piece. You have central bank swaps, which is really where they were lending out a ton of money to bail out the banks in the late 2008 period. You can see that is kind of curtailed. They don't really do too much of that anymore with bank swaps, but that was to bail them out. And then others, I don't know what others is, but hey, you know what, one of their little rainbow of colors for you. So how do we hedge against, or actually, no, I'm not going to talk about hedging. I want to do one more thing here. This is a good one. If you look at the quantitative easing that was done by the Federal Reserve since 2008, that's $3.5 trillion. Yes, that's even more than the market cap of Apple. You will look at the total quantitative easing for central banks around the world, $13 trillion. So, Think of this like a campfire. You're out camping with your friends, you got your family all around the campfire, and it's a nice temperature, everyone's warm and cozy, and here comes some guy and he's got a, a, a little gallon of gasoline and he pours it over the fire. Oh great, it's going to get real hot, it's going to get stinky for a little while, and creosote and all that stuff, but it's going to be a huge fire. What I look at with what central banks around the world have done with $13 trillion of, of debt, it's not you know, some guy with a little can of gasoline. It's a tanker truck of jet fuel and they just poured that on your campfire. A lot of people got burned around that campfire. Now, the fallout from that is the hard part. We don't know exactly what the fallout is as these central banks start to unwind. What it does is it sets a, a bad precedent for our governments and central banks that they can just keep printing money and manipulate economies. The more that you artificially manipulate something, the more likely it's going to come crashing down. And as we've seen, there's been some bubbles with the debt, with interest rates, et cetera. So the government debt is another interesting one. Total government debt around the world, $33 trillion. 
Of course, U.S. is 22 trillion of that. So I thank you for taking the lead. We like to have 66% control of the global debt. That's us. Well, it's jumped. In 2017, that number went from 33 trillion to 63 trillion. So the good news is now we're down to 33% of the global debt with the U.S. But uh, that's where we stand right now, and it's a pretty ugly situation to be in. With this is. I would say insurmountable. The question is, will we ever be able to pay off our debt? I don't believe we will. So if you have money in the bank, the government could devalue your currency. The government could say, all right, well, your dollar is now worth 50 cents in an attempt to devalue our debt. That's a scary position. So what do we do to hedge against those types of threats? Well, again, you can go to precious metals. You can go to different currencies. Um, you know, you can look at a country that might be threatening to devalue their currency. And I look at the United States and boy, it seems to me like that's, that's one of our only solutions going forward down the road might be to devalue the currency. Uh, but there's other investments here. And only 1% of you thought crypto, I think crypto might actually be a decent area to park some of your assets. Not a lot. And I think you need to wait for it to kind of pan out and see how this all kind of shapes up and what the crypto space looks like. But it's a great way to put your money outside of the system, to get it away from a government, get it away from a central bank. Um, granted, there's a lot of manipulation out there. There's still a lot of risks and still a lot of development to be going on. But this is part of the reason that cryptos have garnered so much attention, is this ability to remove themselves from that systemic problem, which could be impacting any country around the world. So those are three of the primary hedges in that space. Now, this is just five very simple things. I know that there's many of you who probably think that there's going to be a lot more than this, and, and I agree. I think that there's more than just five, but these are kind of the big five that we started with. And as we progress as traders, as investors, I think it's important that we all understand that there's going to be ways to make money in any market threat. The key is don't just sit on your hands and let something hit you in the face as it's happening. If you know that these events are out there, we can start to plan for them. And I use the analogy all the time when I'm talking about power trading radio. It's like, uh, I drive here in Southern California, which is an area where everybody thinks they're the greatest driver in the world. It's amazing. They're all Superman behind the wheel, and they're the worst drivers out there. On the freeway, if you're driving and you see someone swerving, what do you do? Do you pull right up next to them? No, you're going to do whatever you can to get out of the way. And I, and I look at these five events we've addressed today, which could be probably extrapolated into 15 or 20 different events. In each one of these are going to have a moment where it starts to swerve and you're going to see market behavior change. That opportunity means, okay, let's become defensive right away for that, whether that's pull our money out of the markets and go to a, a currency that we think will benefit, whether that's going to be going into precious metals or commodities, whether that's going into the equity markets, right? It will alert us to those changes. And as those changes become more solidified in our economy or in our environment, then we can be more proactive with our approach and say, okay, now this is taking full effect. I am now going to go more into this currency area. But we can start to become defensive right away. My big worry is that people get caught off guard with these events, and then they have to be victims of the media, which tell them what to do after the fact. We need to be proactive in this whole thing. That's what the process of trading and investing is all about, is being proactive and making decisions. We have a specific set of rules that we follow every single day. And those procedures can be changed as the market dictates. And in this case, we have five big financial threats, which really, not for 2019, but maybe even longer, could impact our markets going forward. All right, uh, I've gone exceptionally long today. Uh, for those of you who like more information on how to go into the currency markets, how to look at cryptocurrencies, even bonds, looking at things like real estate, options, forex futures, or ways we can capitalize or even tailor a portfolio to be more market resistant should these issues come to light. You can go to otawebinar.com to get more information about which online training academy might be closest to you. There's free classes, paid classes, community events, and much, much more. Bottom line is it's about empowerment. It's about education and understanding exactly what to do in different market situations. So I will leave it here and say thank you guys so much for that today. Uh, now, now that I have a chance, I will uh, end our presentation that way. And I'm going to go to a couple of listener questions. Do we have time for a couple of listener questions? They're shaking their, I'll do, I'll do one quick question. I, I'm, um, aren't they switching back to, uh, da, da. Merlin, so uh, that's hyperinflation, devalue the U.S. dollar? It could be. It could be. And that's an issue. I don't see the U.S. getting that deep in the weeds, right? Generally, that's going to be from countries that don't have a robust economy and aren't as uh, developed. You know, one thing that a lot of people like to point the finger at is they go, well, you know, Japan. Japan has more debt than the United States, right? They're running a 220% GDP. Yeah, they only have four trillion dollars worth of GDP. The United States, if I'm not mistaken, we're running at about 20 trillion dollars worth of GDP. Well, we are at 100 percent. So the numbers become skewed that way a little bit with regards to um, the economies. Uh, all right, one more. Sorry. Um, just keep it on the hardware. How come the 
how the upcoming changes in Venezuela could impact the market. They're not going to impact us. The only thing that would really impact us with Venezuela is if they do decide to peg to the dollar, then that would lock their currency and they would become more stable. If they become more stable, there could be a lot of investment opportunities in Venezuela. But right now, I wouldn't touch Venezuela with a 10-foot pole because you can't get your money there, you can't get your money out. Imagine you're in a, in, a, in a country like Venezuela that has a massive inflation. You're talking thousands of percent inflation, and you can't get your money out. But you look at their market and say, well, there's great opportunity. No, that's not the way to look at it. There's too much risk to take that uh, opportunity, and we talk about that in the bond markets as well. All right, everybody, thank you so much for participating today. I appreciate you joining us. And again, if you'd like more information, go to OTA Web. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.